Hey, uh, welcome to another hour or so uh, with inspiring writers in this truly extraordinary benefit series celebrating Alaska Quarterly Review's 40th anniversary. Features readings and conversations with new and emerging writers, as well as established authors and poets who, like today's guests, have all been published in Alaska Quarterly Review. And you can find the recordings of previous programs at our website and YouTube channel by going to aqreview.org. Uh, today, we have three really interesting writers, and I feel so fortunate to share the next hour uh, with them and you as we listen to them read from their work. I'm Heather Lendy, and on behalf of the Center for the Narrative and Lyric Arts, welcome. We're hosted by the Anchorage Museum at the Rasmussen Center, and thank you today to Rebecca Potterbaum for producing the show. And thank you too to our guest writers and to you for being here. Gunasjish, as we say in Haines, Alaska, where I am today on the, uh, the cold but very sunny banks of the Chilkat River on the homeland of the Tlingit, Jilkatkwan, and Jilkutkwan people. Well, this reading is free. AQR, like all literary journals, could use your help. So please consider a donation. And um, thank you for all of you that have donated. We're well on our way towards our, our modest goal of $15,000. And now I'd like to introduce Ron Spatz. Ron is the co-founder and editor-in-chief of Alaska Quarterly Review, a professor of English at the University of Alaska. He's a former National Endowment for the Arts Fellow and the recipient of two Alaska Governor's Awards and a contribution to a, lit, uh, a literacy award from the Alaska Center for the Book. Under Ron's four decades uh, plus of leadership and vision, AQR has created strong connections between Alaska and the larger literary community in the US and abroad. And AQR has been influential in supporting new uh, writers as well as presenting works that include a rigorous questioning of larger societal issues, something I know Ron is very uh, uh, proud of. Ron? Hey, thank you, Heather. Um, great to see everyone today. Uh, welcome. Uh, this event is being recorded and will be available on the Alaska Quarterly Review YouTube channel. Before we begin, I'd like to make uh, a few important acknowledgments. Alaska Quarterly Review gratefully acknowledges the Anchorage Museum for hosting and providing technical support for this event and Web 907 for its web support. And the Center for the Narrative and Lyric Arts, Alaska Quarterly Review's 501c3 umbrella organization, which makes this event possible. Alaska Quarterly Review also is um, grateful to be in Anchorage and I wanna make a land acknowledgement relevant to that. Alaska Quarterly Review recognizes the indigenous land on which all Alaskans live. AQR is located in Anchorage and Anchorage is Denina homeland. Denina is the language spoken by the traditional present and future caretakers of this land. Land acknowledgement opens a space with gratefulness and respect for the contributions, innovations and contemporary perspective of indigenous peoples and marks our collective movement toward decolonization and equity. Today, we are delighted to present a trio of outstanding writers and poets, Jesse Lee Kershaw, Sarah Eliza Johnson, and Victoria Kelly. Joining me today as co-moderator, the lead co-moderator, uh, is uh, Heather Lindy. Heather is the author of four books, all published by Algonquin. If you lived here, I'd know your name. Take good care of the garden and the dogs. Find the Good, which is this year's Alaska Reads book, and her recently published Of Bears and Ballads. And now to begin, I send it over to Heather. Thanks, Ron. Uh, oh, I'm really excited to hear today's uh, writers, and, and you're going to know all about them here in just a second. Um, Sarah Eliza Johnson grew up in Stratford, Connecticut. Uh, her first book, Bone Map, won the 2013 National Poetry Series and was published by Milkweed Editions in 2014. The Washington Independent Review of Books said of Bone Map that she makes words said and heard for the first time 
who believes that young poets cannot be masters, the reviewer says, adding that each poem is a new backdrop for matters of interest, mostly of love, new circumstances, sometimes surreal, each page an index of bright, beautiful language. Sarah's work has appeared or is forthcoming in Alaska Quarterly Review, Virginia Quarterly Review, Boston Review, Copper Nickel, Blackbird, New England Review, Ninth Letter, Best New Poets, Diagram, Agme, Crazy Horse, Crab Orchard Review, Tampa Review, Memorius, Vinyl, Pleiades, Meridian, Triquarterly, Online, Gulf Coast, Grist, North Dakota Quarterly Review, and has been featured on some of my favorite shows, Poetry Daily, Verse Daily, and the American Academy of Poets Poem A Day series. She's also the recipient of numerous honors, including a 2015 National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship in Poetry, a 2010 Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award, a 2009-10 and 2015-16 Winter Fellowship from the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, and a 2011 Work Study Scholarship to the Breadloaf Writers Conference at Middlebury, as well as fellowships from the University of Oregon and the University of Utah. She currently teaches creative writing at the University of Alaska, Fairbanks. Jesse Lee Kershaval is a poet, memoirist, fiction writer, translator, and uh, self-described cultural explorer. She was born in Fontainebleau, France, and raised in Washington, D.C. and Cocoa, Florida. She's often said her stories and poems in the cool places where she has lived, uh, France, Florida, Wisconsin, Uruguay, and has an abiding interest in the space program and uh, from her childhood near Cape Canaveral. And also um, she's a silent film buff. She's the author of 18 books, including America, that island off the coast of France, winner of the Dorset Prize in Poetry, Underground Women, Space, winner of the Alex Award from the American Library Association, Brazil, winner of the Ruth Ann Wiley Memorial Novella Contest, Cinema Muto, winner of the Crab Orchard Open Selection Award, the Alice Stories, winner of the Prairie Schooner Fiction Book Award, I know, I know that's a lot, and the Dog Eater, winner of the Associated Writing Programs Award for Short Fiction. She's a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and she lives there and in Montevideo, Uruguay. Jessie Lee Kirchival, who says, I tell my students that I think you should be kind and helpful to other people. In the end, that's always the best thing to do, but not necessarily the first impulse of writers to help others. There's probably, I hope, a thread of that in my writing, she says. I've always had a thing against writers who are sarcastic and cruel to their own characters. I love my characters. I try to be kind to them. The world isn't always kind to them. Victoria Kelly is the author of Homefront, the highly acclaimed Mrs. Houdini, which was a People Magazine best new book, a USA Today new and noteworthy book, a Jeopardy pick, and a publisher weekly star debut. She also wrote When the Men Go Off to War and Prayers of an American Wife. Her fiction and poetry have appeared in Best American Poetry, The Autumn House Anthology of Contemporary American Poetry, Prairie Schooner, Southwest Review, and numerous other journals and anthologies. And Victoria published her first two poems, I believe, in Alaska Quarterly Review. Victoria Kelly, who says, I always considered myself a fiction writer and a poetry reader until my husband's deployment inspired me to write when the men go off to war. Now I feel blessed that I consider myself both a novelist and poet. For me, physical space doesn't inspire different genres. It's really about the idea. Some ideas are more suited to poetry, while I know others would make better novels or short stories. I knew immediately when I started thinking about Bess Houdini that I had to write a novel about her search to communicate with her dead husband's spirit. But while When the Men Go Off to War also tells a story of a marriage tested by war that ultimately finds redemption, I found it easier to write that story in verse form. So without further ado, we'll begin with Sarah. Welcome. Hi, uh, hello everyone. Um, I just wanted to say thanks so much to AQR for having me here to support the journal. Um, it's an amazing journal that I've been reading since my MFA years actually, which started in 2006. So I've been 
reading it for a long time and I'm so excited and grateful to have my poems appearing in the new issue, which is my first time in the journal. Um, and because I teach now at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, it's also very close to home. It's kind of feels like a, like, like a, like a kinship right now. So it, it's especially special um, to have my first poems appear in EQR while I've started teaching in the University of Alaska system. Um, it's so nice to see everyone virtually and thanks to everyone for coming to watch on your Sunday evening. Um, I'm just going to pretty much read straight through these poems. Um, they're all from my second manuscript paper, which will be published by Milkweed in 2022 um, in the fall. Um, so I'm not really going to read anything from Bone Map. This is going to be the first reading actually where I haven't read from Bone Map. Um, also, if um, if anybody notices some sound, please alert me because I was hearing my neighbor um, doing some sort of car work and starting their car and it was very loud just a minute ago. So apologies in advance if that happens. Um, the first poem I'm gonna read is called Revelation. Moon's blood smears my forehead, the secret mark of love. I am ready to be loved by anything. I pull the knife from my boot, cut the rainbow shard from my chest, puncture my skull through the ear, pour the last elixir of thought into the soil, a shadow honey, a light the worms eat. Then I cut my soul out, push my form out in loops, the way frost flowers had in those first hours of spring pushed through stems in the fields, mimicking flowers, as my body had mimicked a body. I pushed through my skin the way pain had pushed through my brain, like a tooth through a gum, until I could no longer contain it. I am learning about the power of such pain in its relation to love. Once my body was a sacrifice, then the altar, then the lightning that struck it. I stand now between the severing of the sun and its shadow, when the eclipse slips like a spinal disc and all its white blood pours out through the halo. Now I'm the beast caught in thorns in the forest it once wandered, looking for a home. Now I yield Lie down with what night desires me. Let it consume me. Press my back to the bramble so each thorn grows sharper with my shadow's blood. Then my head rolls away from my neck as if from the door of a tomb. And I climb out from the soft purple tissue at my center. A lamb with claws and a morning star sphere where a beating heart should be lamb that could kill you if you came any closer, lamb that nibbles the grasses from your hand without fear. Parable of the Unclean Spirit. You can't remember what they did to you. Your loneliness is not welcome here, you know, but still you walk the dreamlit village looking for someone gentle enough. There must be an animal trapped under your shirt, you think, because little claws scratch against your chest and you throb there, but you're afraid to look because looking means remembering. You ask a man passing on the road to lift your shirt and check and he wretches at what he sees, says the flesh there overflows as if grinding its own meat, that strips of skin curl away from the wound like rot mushrooms growing on a tree. And he can't help you. You make him sick, he says, he has to go. So you wander some more until you reach the gate, the end of this place you've called home, which is the end of who you could have been, the end of the dream of your body made full with star milk propelled by a heart of sea and enemy. 
You'll be hungry forever if you stay here, trying to hide your secret mouth from all this light. Before you can cross the gate into that dark valley, you must look at yourself. You can think of other words for red, crimson, cherry, scarlet, but there's no other name for blood, no name for a shame like this. It's hiss of pain when you press your finger to it, the sweet stain it leaves on your fingertip. You just have to taste it. Um, these next two poems are actually the ones that are going to appear in the next QR issue. Um, the first one is called Home. All the trees in the backyard have my disease. All crooked, sad things that shake and bend at the threat of teeth or touch, bleed sugar and rust. I think I'm afraid to stop bleeding because it means sleeping forever. On one island grows a tree called dragon's blood that bleeds red sap and arthropods bleed blue threads. The black fin ice fish bleeds clouded milk and far south, a glacier bleeds iron oxide that still feeds an ancient ecosystem. Even flower stems bleed latex, everything bleeds. Still, nothing so beautiful lives inside me. Nothing like the tenderness of horses, their trembling eyelids and tangled manes. Sometimes I cry in the cafe bathroom, in the car, behind a tree, so no one will see. Sometimes I drive out to visit a stranger's horses just to be near them, stand with them a while with my empty hand outstretched like another animal, dark and small, coming out into the light for the first time. Legend. You feel dead now. But there are ways to reach through time, to resurrect yourself. Listen, many years ago, a reindeer died from anthrax in the tundra. The ice kept its body intact. And when the permafrost melted, the carcass thawed, and the spores awoke inside its lungs and heart. Little lesions another reindeer ate and infected the herd which all died, and the shepherd boy who tended the herd died too, after contaminating his entire village. Sometimes the horrors of the world amaze me. In laboratories, scientists have revived bacteria frozen eight million years, and prehistoric viruses from milk water, which became infectious in seconds. From this you learn we're never safe, but maybe it means we're never alone. Under a microscope, the bacteria in me moves like a moon field with an amoebic flower at its center, ancestral organ, petaled afterglow nothing can see, not even itself. I know it by the fever that waxes and wanes against my forehead. As a name you repeat to not forget, or a word for home when you're far away, that homesickness when you've never been home before, but yet, like the miracle of the worm, regrowing its head after the children cut it off, can still somehow find your way back. And this one is called Nebula. The anemone of your dream blooms inside the vacuum of black wind, floats in radial symmetry, a remnant of terror uprooted from its reef. You float without your body, though it lingers like a signature of itself, the swell and implosion of your matter. You a wave that reversed, heard fetal but never closed its loop like sand whirling in the desert, in that memory of violence you still can't erase. Even now, the scorpion's tail there, rippling the sand of your mind. And the man or something in that shape 
asking if you're all right, and you unanswering as he presses his hand against your neck between your thighs, as the sun pulses through your palms, through your chest, and how you burned open then for your world at its end, how your tongue turned to blood and your skin melted pink, your cry for someone, something, heard across space, like the vibrations of distant stars, instruments had once translated into sounds. For us to hear and know, it was not too late to be alive, though it was. Lazarus. Through the mist in this place, I see as the first mammals once saw through their forests, dark photons translating matter into shape, shadow flower, shadow stone, the rippling of bees and their shadow blood weeping inside the trees. My first eye stares back at mine through the leaves and into my chest pours a weight, an infinite pressure inside my heart or left lung like an extinction echoing backward into the first cell of its animal, my body colder in that spot. A thumbprint blooms between my breasts where a stranger once pressed and being so alone, I open like a grave. Migration. We shadows return to the trees, scraping the ground like a snake shedding its skin, or a wolf licking a chest cavity, or your teeth against my neck in the dream I can't stop having, though I move with the herd now, an alphabet growing under my skin, wind tracing each letter with its tongue, learning its form. Who erased your face, the wind asks. How do you see without eyes? If I could answer, I would say, I see as nectar tunneling through a moon. Not through glass, but as dark that learns to love itself. As cloud tissue, as the black glue that holds each thing together, though light would separate it. I see as the tiny ripple that moves through muscle before an earthquake or massacre, the word opening its lesion, the blood of the martyr as it exits the wrist. I see through the hole in my chest that breathes as black holes had breathed against the eyes of the astronomers. When I reach the forest, the trees are soft enough to push a hand through. I find mine among them and ready to begin the long work of growing away from the sunlight that still laps its memory at the edge of my mind. I break my spine, fold my body inside and become paradise. Um, and this is the last one that I'm going to read. Um, it's called Geode. And it actually happens to be the oldest poem in the packet. So it's the last poem that I'm reading and it's the oldest um, that I'm going to read from the manuscript. Geode. You remember the moon over the city had been eaten by worms. You remember how it had no face, how the windows were iced honeycombs as your mother left the church with the basket of cured meat and eggs and bread covered with a handkerchief. Your mother walking in her shadow, your mother, her body at night, a pot of dirt and her blue eyes, the first flowers the wind permits. And ahead, a white horse plodding its carriage past soldiers with machine guns, the scrape scrape of horseshoes on stone and the wind warp of a train, and the snow swell through an alley, like blood rushing into a brain cavity. Think of all this, 
how each skull, like a geode, holds a crystal colony inside. The glittering of synapse, quartz glints of dreams you have not had, mirror bits of other faces and cities you know because someone has told you them. Any bullet there could have been hers. Anyone could have made a hole in her head. Then crystals would have bled into the air, onto the wind, like the snow wafting into the house. Through the window, you forgot to close, which is why you realize you are shivering. Thank you so much. Well, that, those were absolutely stunning, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm so moved by the. Thank you. No, I wish I could give you a hug. Oh, thanks. <laughs> and maybe a pony. <laughs> Wait, what'd you say? And a pony. Oh, a pony would be great. Yes. <laughs> a horse, a horse would be wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, guys. And Jesse, whenever you're ready. Well, I. Um... I think I am the uh, oldest contributor. I, I look back quickly and, my, and um, my first poem was in the Alaska Quarterly Review in 2003. And they've been so supportive. Reynolds has been so supportive of my work. Um, when I heard that the journal was in trouble, I, I wanted to do everything I could. So they've been very gentle about the fact that there's a fundraiser, but I'm a great believer in that poetry exists because of poets. Um, so we found magazines and presses and reading series and we have to support them. They're not some other thing that's just given to us free. So um, if you can at all, um, go to the website and give some, some money to the Alaska Quarterly Review or subscribe um, and do that to as many literary magazines as you can. I tell my students it's kind of an ecology of writing, you know, write a poem, buy a literary magazine, you know, um, write a story, buy a book. Uh, it's all, all, all part of what needs to happen for your poems to find a place in the world when they come out. Um, one of the things that uh, the magazine has been very great about is publishing also not only my own poetry, but um, translations. So I, I live in uh, Montevideo, Uruguay, part of the year, Uruguay. Um, and I, pub I translate uh, Uruguayan poets, especially women poets. They're just an amazing tradition of women poets. And they publish some of my poems from uh, Vadea Villarino, um, her book, The Love, Love Poems, which just came out from the University of Pittsburgh Press. If I have time, I'll read one of those. But first, I'm going to read a poem of mine. Um, which is my latest book, America, That Island Off the Coast of France. And it is one poem, um, and so you won't panic. <laughs> it's a poem in 50 sections, but they're very short sections. So you can sort of know where I am as I go along. And it's in 50 sections, it'll become clear to you because of the title. Actually, I think rather than reading from the book, it's easier to read it on the screen, isn't it? Not, it looks like I'm looking at you. Um, the title is, uh, 49 answers to 50 questions. One, I was born in Fontainebleau, France in 1956, or I was born in Paris. In Fontainebleau, where Emperor Napoleon bade farewell to his old guard saying, adieu my friends, would I could press you to my heart. Or in Paris near, near the Canal Saint-Martin, where the barges moved slowly toward La Villette, the biggest slaughterhouse in Europe. Two, my mother was either a Calvinist Kentucky from Kentucky, a major in the US Army who liked cigarettes and bourbon and only married when she was 40, or a French housemaid, a Jewish orphan raised in a convent who turned 19 the day I was born. Three, both of them are dead. Both of them lived in dread of God and war and bad news in the night, and so do I. Four, by the window in this rental cottage are four bird houses. They are inside, not outside. So birds can only window shop, only dream of a life inside a home, inside a home, inside a home, and they often feel the same. Five, either I had two mothers or none, neither option, biologically speaking, possible for mammals. Six, the Jews deported from France left quietly. There was, of course, some weeping. Seven, on Bastille Day, every year, I set my prisoners free. Eight, a fellow soldier shot my mother in World War II. He was mad, she was lonely. That was one mother. The other was on her knees in a convent saying mass while her parents were gassed in Poland. 
At least part of this is something that I know. Nine, my greatest fear that I'm wasting my life, though since you cannot hoard time like pennies, I am not sure what I can do about it. 10, in my dreams, I fly. In my dreams, I am always outside looking in. In my dreams, I am inside a house that is inside a house, inside a house. Birdhouses, universes, then someone shoots me from the sky and I wake up. 11, if I could be in France, 1956, being born, I would know once and for all who my mother was. Why can't I remember? 12, why does it matter whose womb I was lifted from, whose blood, belly the surgeon cut, whose blood the nurses washed from my downy head? Forget it, I tell myself. Death closer to me every second than being born. 13, and my own children closer than any of my mother's. Thus we set the past rights wrong, the past wrongs right. 14, which include all of my unkindnesses to both my mothers. 15, and give thanks even for the gifts that come be ribboned in our own blood. 16, like the joy of seeing my own children lifted from me. 17, I should mention my poor papa who slept with both my mothers, but who worked hard and came home to read to me each night. 18, I still tell myself stories to help me fall asleep, and it is his voice I hear inside my head, even when what he is telling me are lies. 19. It was simpler when I thought I only had one mother. I was lonely when I only had the one. When my daughter was four in a preschool where all the other children's parents were divorced and remarried or were lesbians, she turned to me and asked, where is my other mother? 20. I wish I had just one of mine alive to be a grandmother to my children. 21. This cottage where I'm sleeping is like a birdhouse. Bare wooden slats form an A above my head. And outside my window, I hear owls and stars, not sounds you hear in Paris. 22. My mouth tastes like black coffee stirred with a metal spoon. 23. Coffee black is the dreams of the blind. No. I have no way to know that. Black as the dreams of my Kentucky mother used to scream, no, 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 at night. 24. Once I took my children to the top of the Eiffel Tower where all Paris lay spread at our feet like the dream of a toy city. 25. Once I was going to have a second daughter and name her Lily. 26. I'd be saying, I would, I'd be lying if I told you that I always told the truth. Sometimes I just forget to. Sometimes I don't remember anymore. 27. Where do you find a legless dog? Exactly where you left him. That's a joke. And when my daughter tells it, it gets me every time. 28. If you cut the wolf open, do you get your child, your mother back again? Or does that only work for woodmen who carry freshly sharpened axes? 29. I'm not sure why I wanted to name a daughter Lily, a waxy flower appropriate for funerals, for fleur de lis, I guess, for France, for everything I left there, birth mother, birth language, then Lily was lost to me as well. 30, love is a house and we are hungry birds inside it. 31, just writing that makes me angry, me the chick waiting for the worm in spite of having, in spite of having two damn mothers. Why am I so hungry? 32, anger is what keeps this birdhouse warm. 33, my mother was a soldier unless my mother was a whore. 34, a linguist once told me human beings exist to carry words from one location to another, language the chicks inside the birdhouse, language what lives on. 35, I also have a deep fear of memory loss, forgetting even what I cannot say I know. 36, I'm amazed by all the things my son remembers, names of kings, dates of wars. Little by little, I am letting him take over history as the family dinner table topic. 37, except for the secrets, except for the things he will never know. 38, it is madness, you know, this trying to learn the truth about the past. It is madness to think there even is one. 39, it is a grace to write a poem and share my madness with you, gentle reader. It is madness to think what I write down and you read is still a secret, but I beg you, please 
Do not tell a soul. 40, can I trust you? 41, I miss Paris. I miss having two mothers, both of them alive, each holding a hand as we cross the Champs de Mars. I don't think that ever happened. 42, I do not want to see another funeral. I do not want to read another will. I do not want to die until my children are much, much older. I do not want to be buried any place at all. 46, 43, sorry. I was born a different person, one of those God chose, then subsequently historically forgot. 44, in French, my name sounds like heart of a knight, but it is Breton and means horse house or plain old barn. The first name I carry now means God exists, though I am no proof. When I was born in Hebrew, my name meant Lily. 45, once and only once, I was born in the same country on the same day to two very different women and I have two birth certificates to prove it. Proof, if you need it, that words on paper lie. 46, the answer is maybe there are two of me and I'm the only one who doesn't know it. 47, never assume a complicated answer when there is one so simple, my birth mother handing me to another and never looking back. 48, I want to go back in time so I can hold their hands so tightly I get to keep both mothers, but I cannot. In 1956, in France, I was born twice to two completely different mothers. 49, I wish that were a lie. 50. Let's see, do I have time to sneak in a translation? A quick one, okay. This book, which is love poems, is because they're all written by Dea Villarino to a man, a novelist, with whom she had a long and famous affair. And this one is called Alms. Open the hand and give me the sweet, sweet crumb, as if a god, as if the wind, as if the burning dew, as if never. Here, open the hand and give me the sweet, dirty crumb, or perhaps give me the tender hand that sustains you not the skin or the disordered hair or the breath or the saliva or everything that slips unconnected past the skin. No, if it is possible, if you hear me, if you are here, if I am someone, if it is not an illusion, a crazy lens, a grim mockery, open the hand and give me the dirty, dirty crumb. As if a God, as if the wind, as if the hand opens that distracts destiny and we're granting us a day. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Jesse. I'm going to have to go reread that again and, and again. 50. I, I'm thinking about that. <laughs> um, Victoria. Um, well, thank you uh, to both of you for the beautiful poetry that I now have to follow. Um, but it was really, really inspiring. I want to just race out and um, get both your books I can read. Um, so yeah, that was just, um, I really enjoyed listening to that. Um, so I wanted to, um, first of all, say thank you to AQR for having me do this. Um, actually, I owe my whole poetry career to um, journal because when I first started writing poetry for real, in the middle of a novel and I was facing a lot of writer's block and so I decided to take a poetry class to kind of just, um, be creative with really no intention of um, publishing anything um, but the first few class did end up being out um, and you are accepted them and without that acceptance I wouldn't really have had the confidence to keep going with it um, and what eventually those two poems came uh, my first book uh, when the men go off to war and so really is um, a result of that belief in, in my work so I just owe oh, a debt of gratitude uh, to the journal and everybody for really my my poetry for uh, so I think I'll start um I'll start with the title poem, which is called One Men Go Off to War. I'm going to read poems today. Three and then three 
um, my netbook, which is not finished yet. Um, but uh, I'll give you a backstory. Um, I met my husband when I was 19 years old. He was um, at the Naval Academy, and we ended up getting married. Um, I spent 10 years as a Navy spouse. Um, he was a fire pilot. The Navy did three deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria. Um, and the book came out of those deployments. Um, and so I'll, I'll read, uh, I'll read the first poem the book. Um, what happens when they leave is that the houses look like paper dolls. The children fluff their socks and sweaters and tuck the dogs little black suitcases. Across the street, the trees are rooting mailboxes rising up like dandelion stems and eventually we too float off the houses tucked neatly inside our purses and the children tumble gleefully after us and beneath us the base has disappeared the rows of pink houses all the way to the ocean gone and the whole city has slipped off the white earth like a table being cleared for lunch we set up for a few weeks at a time in places like Estonia or Laos, places where they still have legends, where a town of women appearing in the middle of the night is surprising, but not unheard of. The locals come to watch our strange carnival unpacking in some wheat field outside Paldiski. We invite them in for coffee, forgetting for a minute that some of our own men won't come home again and sometimes a wife or two won't be there. She'll meet someone else, say, and it's one of those things we don't talk about, how people fall in and out of love, and also what the challenges are for. And then a few days before the planes fly in, they return. We roll out the sidewalk and make the beds, tether the trees to the yard. On the airfield, everything is as it should be. Our mat stick, the baby blanketed inside rollers. Only our husbands look at us a little sadly, the way people do when they know they have changed but don't want to say it. Instead, they say, What have you been doing all this time? And we say, Oh, you know, the dishes. And they laugh and say, Thank God something stayed the same. Um, and that poem was um, featured in Best American Poetry um, 2016. And so I'll always um, be very, very grateful for that, um, which is a wonderful experience to be included in that anthology. Um, this next one I'm gonna read is called Almost. And this is the first one that was did um, by AQR. And so I have to read that um, because it really was the start of everything. Um, for the poetry side of my career. Um, so this poem um, is written during deployment. I didn't have any kids yet. And it was a very strange life. I lived the ocean um, by myself. I had no family around. Um, and it was a lot of boredom, but also a lot of kind of time to um, figure out what I wanted to do. And I was writing and I was teaching um but makes you kind of stop and think about the life that you could have had if you'd been a different path and that's what this is about i can imagine living a whole life in the house my parents almost bought in morse plains across from this train station the way i almost played red light green light in the park next to the library and almost went to school in Bird's parish Wall Avenue. The way my father almost made 30 years of slow moonlit walks to the station in winter. My mother reading from the kitchen window. I imagine growing up and almost taking the same train to some publishing job in the sea and coming home to dinner next door to children who on weekends almost hunt for clovers in the same park. I almost knew the name of once and how different that life barely passed me by seems now this lonely sunny afternoon at the beach on some base in Virginia 
under the brick red summer, the mother sportified under hat and sun, the tired children slowing down around me, and a man who could almost be my father, leaving to the person behind me. Uh, and then, um, let's see. Um, this next one is called Annapolis. And this was uh, a reflection many years later on the um, day that I had my first husband um, when he was in his third year at Naval Academy. Um, and if you haven't been to Annapolis, Maryland, it's a, a very wonderful place. I somehow ended up back there very close to because I actually now live in Maryland again after a long, long route through many countries and states. So, um, when I knew you were one of a thousand blue-coated boys surging to gates on a Saturday, it was April, but there was still a little snow on the grass, and I was young enough to think I was pretty, not so that I was troubled by it or enabled. Funny that I can't picture my shoes, only the street underneath them, pitted like the rind and orange, worn out by a hundred thousand young men just like you. The shipmen, their covers tipped over their eyebrows, each one knowing it will never belong there more than now. For a few hours, the clatter of this liberty is theirs, because it will never look the same as it does on a Saturday night in April or curfew. For June, before the president shakes your hand and you are someone for a moment. Before the honeymoon and the ardence of marriage, before carrier endings on dark nights, before your are in Afghanistan and want you dead, before the pageantry of your homecoming, before wanting nothing except to go back to the war, yes, but maybe you would keep going if you could, all the way to the church. Or the first light of Pensacola, the crowded street where we were just kids, nothing except there was more, and it would certainly be everything we drew up. Um, the next one I'm going to read um, is called Haunted, and this was actually based on a hotel that we lived in in um, Virginia. Um, said by many to be haunted. I never saw the ghost, but um, there were lots of ghost stories and just um, very hotel. A lot of famous people and presidents and writers had stayed there uh, over the years. And so I was just involved by it. So it actually plays a major role in the um, next collection. It was said some say on as ghosts, the Bella, the heiress, Cat drowned, their soft or violent ends going through the elevator shafts and the empty swimming pool. All the locals knew the clay bull and still bought the building 40 years later when he had become here in society. They were not malevolent, explained, just bad sometimes. My father spoke to ghosts. He knew things he did not have known. He knew of about attics and corridors and could find any grave in a cemetery he'd never seen before. I brought him to the abandoned lobby one night as the restaurant downstairs was closing and stepped aside as if he would move his hands and bring them out. They came. Maybe they're upstairs, I said, imagining them creeping through the rooms, like footed as monks. My father shook his head. It's like that. Science, he said. Either you believe or you don't. Anything between is just disappointment. And so I'm going to fast forward through my life story a lot, many years. Um, and actually, I am getting worse after 10 years of marriage. Um, and like they say, the military lifestyle really takes a toll on, on families, unfortunately. Um, of course, was the victim of um, part of that. Um, but uh, funnily enough, I ended up remarrying um, a veteran um, who was a 
a Marine veteran um, who fought in the war in Iraq. Um, and uh, so this poem I wrote um, kind of about the um, irony that I would end up and was in the same war, but at a very different time, a very different thing. Um, and uh, one, you know, first husband was flying. My husband now was a Marine on the ground. And so um, this is called Before My First Husband's War. Long before there was his war, there was yours. That spring, when he and I were still just kids, drinking in the bar above the Chinese restaurant. I was just 16 and reading a tree near a statue on Harvard was everything. You were already caught in the fist of war in that battle no one saw coming. Even now, though you'd never die it, all those those lives knew that went up like snow from over top in Ramadi, the blood pulling around their ears like candle wax. Still come back to meet you in a bar in a while, dinner or in our bed, both faces on the wall. War would come to him and me too, but we didn't know it yet. Instead, we hit up our glasses. We had our whole lives of us. While you, you were already real somewhere else. Somewhere else was already so real for you. That feeling like you might not be back. Like you never get to marry that girl. I that not go. Come lit night to the baby sing with his arm around the dog. God, take me back to that place to bear it all with you the way I did for him. Um, and then the last poem I'm going to read is uh, dedicated to my daughter. Um, and uh, I have two daughters, and they were both very young. Um, they went through the divorce and um, eventually married. Uh, and there was this period of transition where, um, you know, it's a very conflicted time of what to do with your kids and how you handle the situation. And I wrote this poem for her. Um, it's called Conversation on My Boyfriend. Yesterday, my daughter looked up from her troop of animals and said, I hope you marry him. She's sure I will. She knows which dress she'll wear, the color of roses she'll cup in her hands. The morning will be polished as a spoon. How can I tell her I don't know how the story ends? How can I explain I love him the way someone of a fish through water? The moment it's there and the next it's gone. Listen, I should tell her. It's you all forever. It's the only thing I know for sure. At night, when I'm in my bed and you're in yours, clutching your lion at your chest, those bowls of dreams moving into your eyes, everyone else is a stranger. Nothing else is as real. The room now. Your cheek on the horror tucked inside the folds of your bed. It's a body as small as you missed. Don't worry, you say, the benediction, like a secret you've been carrying for years for you. It may be true, but I will pray if you find idols, you're really just looking for God. No. Thank you, Victoria. There's a lot to think about. <laughs> um, and I'm wondering if, while we have the three of you and we, we have a few minutes left, um, if, if you'd care to, to sort of make any reflections on, on this last year um, and, and how um, maybe that's affected you, um, your work, or, or anything at all. Uh, comment even among each other about what, what you've heard. Um, I'd like to hear more from you all uh, about your work and, and lives and, and, and how you do it and why. It seems like you're reading very new work, Sarah. Is that, has the, uh, the pandemic fed into that work? 
Yeah, I would say, yeah, I would say so. I think that um, the solitude of the pandemic has really allowed for a lot of like depth in the writing practice um, just because it's, it just, you know, it's a product of maybe having more time, but also just having more time like um, alone, especially in the winter. <laughs> um, yeah, I found it, it, at times I found it harder to write during the pandemic than I normally would. And sometimes I found it um, easier to write sort of poems that maybe I wanted to write, but was kind of, you know, somewhat prevented from doing so because I you know, was so busy and um, couldn't really go maybe as deep emotionally as I wanted to, I would say. What about you? Actually, it's, it's turned me, I haven't written very many poems. It's turned me into an essay writer. Somehow that was my response to writing about the immediate thing. Cause I just wanted to, to say, oh, this is happening. This is happening. This is happening. And although I've actually written a memoir, it sort of has more fiction structure and I'd never written sort of literary essays before. So um, I it was just sort of just beginning to get back into poems. And I couldn't, I was so interested in yours because you're the, the, really quite moved by them and the, the largeness of them to encompass emotions. I, I, uh, I sort of poetry wasn't doing that for me during the pandemic. Somehow I had, okay. to, had to, I mean, some of my essays are a little lyric, but mostly they're just like, blah, 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 this is happening. <laughs> yeah, I think probably the landscape of Fairbanks might help with that a little bit too. Thinking about like the sort of vastness and the darkness maybe of the landscape, I think kind of maybe contributes a bit to winter writing for me in ways that the summer doesn't. It's just like a, it's a unique place in the winter. Um, and that can be bad <laughs> in some ways and it can be good in other ways. So, um, so yeah, I've act, I wrote essays as well, more than I would have thought, um, but they're lyric essays. They're not, they're not memoir, um, at least not a straight memoir. And one of them actually I'm publishing with AQR also, um, it's called Unspeakable and it is, um, using Rosemary's Baby as a sort of lens to look um, at all sorts of um, trauma and wow. pregnancy fears. So yeah, it's part of a larger project that I've been working on this winter also. Um, and I do think the pandemic, again, like allowed me a little time maybe to do work on both projects, which I would not necessarily have been able to do um, if I had more of like a social life. <laughs> What about you, Victoria? You've been able to get some writing done? Um, yeah, so like the year for me, um, only another novel. Um, I, I also, I, I want to just put in a plug for not very special, small presses um, because uh, actually I also to go publish a story in AQR now part of a collection that's being published by a small press called Engine Press. Um, it was actually supposed to come out last year, and then I pushed back, so it's coming out this year um, on front. Um, and just, you know, talking to them, it's kind of just small in general. I mean, published in general, you know, with journals and smaller, smaller publishing houses, and so just you know, want to put a plug in for um, supporting all of them because I know they've been struggling um, for fun. At, um, yeah, I hope I'm um, just, you know, uh, my fix and now I, I'm going to finally finish my, but I feel like my mind is going back to the trees to finish that. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a while since I got re of the pandemic too. So, um, stepmother, you know, virtual. It's been a crazy time. <laughs> Thank you, Victoria. You're cutting in and out a little bit, so I was I was having a hard time hearing it. I'm I'm sorry about that. Um, but uh, it. Uh, I'm also. Um, I think we have just another minute or two. I'm wondering if. Um, there were there were books that you turned to or things that you read 
um, during the last year that um, were um, some some solace or or that you discovered um, a new author or re reread older older writers that you um, went back to, if that happened. I know Jesse, maybe as a translator, maybe you found something, but I'm just curious. Well, you know, I'm always, I'm always reading a lot of Uruguayan poetry. It's, until I translate it, it's probably not so available to you. I actually have been fascinated by a, a column that a woman named uh, Sarah Ora Marx has had in the blog on the Paris Review, where she's been talking about what's been happening during the pandemic, mixed and her, being a mother mixed with fairy tales. It's really quite a wonderful thing. It comes out once a month, I think. Um, and um, and somehow the, the idea of, of elevating or changing the lens on the way we look at what's been going on. So there, there's somewhat little surreal and a little manic, but also just you know reality. So so um, um, uh, that's that's just one thing. I was just reading one of them this morning that anyone could go online and read. I'm sure they'll be out in a book soon. But it's it there. It's a it's a column. Uh, in the Paris Review online. Sarah, you've, you've picked up anything different or a different kind of a habit? Um, yeah, I've been thinking about this since you asked. Um, I'm not sure if I picked up anything different, but um, I have read some books this year. Like, I'm not sure if the pandemic affected anything, but um, some of the books that I've enjoyed have been a bit um, more experimental in um, nonfiction, just because that's kind of what I'm working on right now as a project. So um, with my grad students, I read um, In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado, which is a really interesting um, like approach to memoir that sort of um, like takes a concept and then looks at it from all different angles. Um, and it's, it's, about, um, it's about a domestic abuse narrative um, primarily. And um, I, finally read The Chronology of Water by Lydia, Lydia Yudnovich, which I hadn't actually, I hadn't actually read yet. It was one I had it that kind of, you know, slipped under my radar and wasn't taught to me. So, um, and that was also a very inspiring book. And so I think like I've been reading a lot of things that maybe experiment formally for nonfiction um, to try to start to think about the arc of, of a book narrative that does that. Um, and yeah, I think that part of it also is, is that the pandemic has given me more time, I think, to work on two projects, which has helped, um, helped me to sort of maybe branch out of, out of my poetry comfort zone a bit. Victoria, I think we can hear you. Did you, have you discovered anything that uh, particularly that you found this year to be um, compelling? Um, yes, you can hear me. I'm the internet issues. Um, recently, that I found a used bookstore I just loved. Um, it's by Vanita Hampton Wright and it's called The Soul Tells the Story. And it's about the intersection of creativity and spirituality. Um, and I just found it so inspiring. So it was just a really uplifting book in the middle of these times. So definitely recommend. Well, thank you. Um, uh, thank, thank all of you for coming. Are there any last thoughts that anybody might might want to share with us before? Um, Just thank you very much for your this, lives. <laughs> thank you very, very much for this reading. Thank, thanks, the Alaska Quarterly Review for all its years of, of uh, publishing wonderful work. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. I feel like I, I need to sort of sit in the stillness of all the words I, 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 um, <laughs> I, I heard today. Um, sometimes, um, for me, when I, especially when I hear poetry, that's kind of what I have to do is just sit with it a minute. <laughs> and and um, it's really uh, such a gift that, that you all um, gave us today. So thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for having thank me. Thank you so much. It was amazing to hear um, your poems, Victoria and Jesse, um, to hear what you've been working on too over the pandemic. So um, yeah, it's it's, it's been fun. I'm very grateful for AQR. Yeah, I'm grateful for all of you. And, um, and again, uh, thank you uh, for joining us today for uh, another 
episode in AQR's 40th anniversary literary series and uh, on behalf of the Center for the Narrative and Lyric Arts. Um, all of our gratitude for the generosity of today's uh, kind of mind-blowing writers, <laughs> thank you. And um, also to Rebecca Potterbaum and Cody Carver and the staff at the Anchorage Museum at the Rasmussen Center who produced this program. And as, as a Jesse noted, uh, please consider um, uh, making a gift. Um, uh, you know, the writers that come to you um, today um, need places to put poems and stories and their first ones or continuing ones, and we all need uh, to read them. Um, so places like Alaska Quarterly Review and other literary magazines won't exist without your support. So. Um, consider that. And for those of you that have already been, uh, uh, donated um, so generously, thank you um, very much. We're well on our way towards reaching a modest goal of $15,000. And, um, and um, all of you uh, enjoy your next week. I, I hope you take care of yourselves. And um, if, if possible, maybe you can take care of somebody else too. And uh, thank you. Uh, again, for joining us for the writers and for you, and I'll turn it over to Ron. Yes, I want to echo what uh, Heather said, and I want to thank uh, Heather for being our main moderator <laughs> every week that we've done it, every time. So um, thank you all to Sarah and Victoria and Jesse Lee. Very, very grateful for your participation today. Um, to our viewers, thank you for joining us. And um, two weeks from tonight, or this afternoon, depending on where you are, uh, we have our next March reading uh, with uh, fiction writers and nonfiction writers. They do both. Jerome Charon, Lee Connell, and Debbie Urbanski. So that should be um, a pretty, um, pretty spectacular uh, event. We're looking forward to it. In April, um, the final three Sundays in a row, um, we have Pure Poetry, three events with all poets for National Poetry Month. And um, our final event, our CODA event, is on Sunday, May 2nd. So um, hope to see you at all of those. And I want to thank everybody again um, and uh, our friends at the Anchorage Museum who uh, are hosting this event. So thank you and uh, good afternoon or good evening to everyone.